Previously, we were discussing some interesting aspects about the battle of the trench, also known as Al Ahzab, the parties, or the Khandaq, which is the trench. And we mentioned how some interesting miracles occurred, you know, as the battle was ongoing. Now let's continue and see what exactly happened and, and what events led to the actual battle. So the huge Arab armies who had conspired to make a fatal attack on Medina, aided by some Jewish enemies of the Prophet, they came to the city of Medina and they just swarmed the city of Medina with their huge numbers. Then they reached the banks of the Khandaq, of the trench that the Muslims had dug. This surprised the enemies. They thought that this time it's going to be like the previous time they came for the battle of Uhud. For the battle of Uhud, the pagans of Mecca, they came to Medina by the foot of Mount Uhud and that's where the battle happened and that's where many Muslims got killed including Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet Now during the battle of Uhud, their numbers were much less. Now they had united with so many other tribes to come and kill the Muslims. So they thought if at the battle of Uhud we almost won the war, they got very close to the Prophet. Between them and the Prophet were just basically five people. Imam Ali and a few other companions who stayed. All the other companions fled. If you remember, we talked about the battle of Uhud in detail. So the pagans thought if at the battle of Uhud we got that close with our smaller numbers, now that we have massive tribes gathered at Uhud, it's going to be an easy job. We're going to obliterate these Muslims. So when they continued their march until they reached the banks of the ditch, they were surprised. What is this? All the vulnerable parts of Medina where you can make an attack, there's a ditch, there's a huge trench. Remember last time we talked about the logistics of that trench, how deep and wide it was. You couldn't cross it. It's very deep. So they were very surprised and disappointed. Then they said the following. They said Muhammad has learned these war tactics from the Iranians or from an Iranian, meaning who? Salman. Because the Arabs are not familiar with, these, with this type of warfare, digging a trench. The Prophet surprised them. Now notice one arrogant point in their statement. Muhammad has learned these tactics from an Iranian. When they say that, in reality, what are they rejecting? They are disregarding the fact that the Prophet is connected to Allah. Until when are you guys going to believe that? The Prophet has revelation from Allah. So Allah is always going to reveal to him ways to achieve victory. But they were arrogant. They did not want to admit that. That he is connected to God. Oh, he learned this war tactic from an Iranian. What do you mean? He's a Prophet. He receives revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They just could not accept any sign from the Prophet. Now you could ask why were they so adamant in rejecting the signs? Why were they so stubborn? Number one, jealousy. The chiefs of Quraysh, the big, the big heads, the big shots, right? Like Abu Sufyan and these others, they were driven by jealousy. Okay, we know there's something special about Muhammad, but why him and not me? They would openly declare that jealousy. Why him? Why did God choose him and not me? And it's difficult for arrogant people to follow someone younger than them who's chosen by God. Jealousy blinds you to the truth. That's why it's very important when you make important decisions, make sure jealousy is not acting upon you. If you see the truth, accept it. Who cares where it's coming from, from whom it's coming from. It doesn't matter, accept the truth. Don't let jealousy blind you. Sometimes we, we see elders in the community, they reject the truth, why? Because somebody younger is doing that which is right. And they know in their hearts it's right. 
but hey, I can't accept that. I'm in a higher position. Well, that's your trial. That's your test. So that's one reason why they stubbornly reject it. Number two, the reason why they were arrogant is because the Prophet was not rich with luxuries. The Prophet was very humble. You look at him from the outside, he looks like a regular person. It's easy to submit to someone who has a royal setup around him, right? If there's a king sitting on a high throne with a huge golden crown, the average person can easily submit to him because you're just taken by that royalty, right? But when you see someone humble, wearing clothes that you, whom you think you're a big shot, his clothes are, you know, less than your clothes. His money is less than your money. It's hard to follow this person. And that's the test of this dunya. It's easy to follow a king. If Allah had made Prophet Muhammad a king, with all that power, with a throne, with a crown, believe me, these arrogant Arabs would have submitted to him overnight because he's a king and people just submit to kings. But they challenged the Prophet. They're like, well, if God has chosen you, how come you're not like a king? We don't see any royal treatment. But that's the trial. Sometimes Allah wants you to follow someone who's just so humble. Materialistically, doesn't have much. That's the, that's the real trial. So let's look at the number of soldiers from both sides. The army of the Arabs, they had more than 10,000 fighters. Now you can just imagine their swords on the other side of the trench, just you know, dazzling in your eyes. It's a scene. It's a scene that frightens you. When you see 1,000 swords shining in bright sunlight on the other side, it's a scary scene. Just imagine what the Muslims had to go through. So to give you some specific numbers here, as Al-Maqrizi states, a historian by the name of Al-Maqrizi, he states this in his book Al-Imta. He says Quraysh only, the people of Mecca, they had 4,000 soldiers. They had 300 horses and 1,500 camels. So they had a lot of resources with them. Then the tribe of Salim joined them and they had 700 men. Then the tribe of Bani Fazara joined them with 1,000 fighters. Then the tribe of Bani Ashja and Bani Murrah, each giving 400 fighters. When you put them all together, the Quraysh and all these tribes, their numbers exceeded 10,000. Note, my dear brothers and sisters, that at the time, 10,000 exceeded the population of Medina several times. How much was the population of Medina at the time? Two to 3,000 according to estimates. Now imagine you live in a population, in a city with a population of 2 million, right? Let's say you live in a city that has a population of 2 million. Then you're confronted with an army of 10 million people. Can you just imagine the scale? So look at these Muslims. They're surrounded by an army that's several times bigger, not than their army, than their whole city, than your whole population. Your whole population is around 3,000 in Medina. And these guys are 10,000. It's really scary. It's a, it was one of the biggest trials of the Muslims was the Battle of Ahzab. I mean, what are the odds of you defeating such an army? No matter how skilled you are. You're, they, they outnumber your entire population, very slim. Imagine how you would feel. Now the Muslims, according to many estimates, their fighters were 1,000. You have 1,000 fighters and you're confronted by 10,000. So they were camping at the foot of Mount Sala. There was a mount in Mecca, in Medina by the name of Mount Sala. That's where the Muslims were camping. This place is an elevated spot. Basically, the Muslims could fully monitor the enemy from, you know, uh, this elevated area. They could see all the ditches and the trenches. They could monitor the movements of the enemy. So they really had a good logistical position. And the Muslims were also given different posts by the Prophet ﷺ to guard them, to make sure no one crosses the trench. So to guard all the areas where they could potentially cross. 
So the enemy, when they came to this trench, they were surprised. They didn't know what to do. Do you know how long the Arab armies stayed on the other side of the trench trying to figure out a way to come to Medina without any success? How long did they stay there? Any idea? A month. They camped on the other side of the big trench for a month not knowing how to get in, inside the city of Medina. So it was a beautiful tactic that the Prophet employed with his companions. During this period, only a few people were able to cross it from the mushrikeen. We'll see later who and what happened and how Imam Ali salam confronted them. Many people tried to attempt crossing, but the Muslims had special stones. Anyone who would try to cross the trench from the other side, they would pelt him with stones. That was their strategy. So they just could not figure out a way to jump over this trench or go inside. They, they didn't know how, what, what to do. Any way they could come up with to try to cross the trench, they would be pelted by stones. They had to retreat and go back. They have any arrows right left? Yeah, the Muslims also had arrows. But remember, because they were poor, they didn't have that many arrows. So you don't want to use your arrows initially. Use it when you have to. But stones, they're available everywhere. <laughs> so it was a good strategy. Yeah, th those guys had arrows, but they're on the other side of the trench. The Muslims can guard themselves, you know, uh, behind army posts. So they had a way to guard themselves. They were far from the trench. So the enemy could not cross the trench. But on this other side, the Muslims were well inside, in, a, in, in an elevated spot. So how big was it? I forgot you said how deep and how wide. It was huge. So imagine several yards deep and maybe like seven to nine yards wide. Shukran, thank you. So we're talking about a huge trench over here. 